The fine and dry weather will continue into the evening, although it will remain rather breezy, especially in the south. And that is how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you oh. look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to those of you joining me on TV, DAB, DAB rather, and online. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, and today we're going to be discussing Northern Ireland. Power sharing, are its days numbered? We'll be putting the Northern Ireland protocol through its paces, through our scrap, reform or keep segment. But first, it's the news with Simon Pusey. Good afternoon, it's two o'clock. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB newsroom. The war in Ukraine has dominated the Conservative Party's spring conference, with the Prime Minister saying Russia's president launched the invasion because he fears a free and democratic nation as his neighbour. Boris Johnson told the Tory faithful Vladimir Putin is panicking about the prospect of a revolution in Moscow. He was frightened of Ukraine because in Ukraine they have a free press and in Ukraine they have free elections. And with, with every year that Ukraine progressed, not always easily, towards freedom and democracy and open markets. He feared the Ukrainian example and he feared the implicit reproach to himself. Because in Putin's Russia, you get jailed for 15 years just for calling an invasion an invasion. And if you stand against Putin in an election, you get poisoned or shot. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss told the forum the crisis in Ukraine has shown the strength of the free world. Meet here in Blackpool. We face a different world from the one we've known over the past decades. Putin's illegal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has shattered the notion that freedom is free. We cannot stand by and see these precious freedoms eroded and the clock turned back to the horrific oppression of the Soviet era. We cannot and we will not rest until Ukraine's sovereignty is restored. 
Meanwhile, the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace told GB News Russia needs to be judged by its actions, not by its words. And as the Prime Minister said, the problem is if he's successful in Ukraine, it won't stop there because in his own articles and speeches, you know, he effectively lays claim to the Baltic states and other parts of, of what was either once the former Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. And I think it's really important people understand that when you have a president who, who writes and speaks like he does about sort of ethnic nationalism uh, and that he has sort of rights over them, then, then we should all worry for our own security. It's that type of language that led to the Second World War. Ben Wallace there. In Ukraine, the prosecutor's office says 112 children have been killed since the start of the Russian invasion. In the east, the governor of Luhansk says a humanitarian corridor is being opened for residents trying to evacuate the region. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Zelensky is calling for face-to-face -face talks with his Russian counterpart, telling Vladimir Putin it's time for comprehensive and meaningful negotiations. I want everyone to hear me now, especially in Moscow. The time has come for a meeting. It is time to talk. The time has come to restore territorial integrity and justice for Ukraine. Otherwise, Russia's losses will be such that it will take several generations to recover. In other news, Syria's president has made his first trip to an Arab state since the start of the war in his country 11 years ago. Travelling to the United Arab Emirates, President Bashar al-Assad met Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince Sheikh Zayed al Nain in a sign of strengthening ties between the two nations. The U.S. has reacted, saying it's disappointed and troubled by the apparent attempt to legitimise the Syrian leader. Four people on board a U.S. military aircraft have died following a crash in northern Norway. The country's Joint Rescue Coordination Center confirmed the Marine Corps aircraft was taking part in a NATO military exercise when it went missing. The government is being urged to publish the legal advice it received on whether P&O ferries broke the law when it sacked its staff. Labour is asking if there are legal moves ministers could take to reverse the decision. 800 employees were fired without consultation via a pre-recorded message on Thursday. Former British Airways chairman Sir Martin Broughton says his group has global backing for its Chelsea Football Club bid. Three groups are vying for the club, which was put up for sale by Roman Abramovich after he was sanctioned by the government for having links to Vladimir Putin. The Chelsea Supporters Trust says positive discussions are being held with the prospective new owners. British property developer Nick Candy and Chicago Cubs owners the Ricketts family have also submitted bids. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. Back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. Here's what's coming up on the show today. So first up, we'll be focusing on Northern Ireland to start the show. A government minister has urged all the parties in Northern Ireland to commit themselves to restoring power share in government before the forthcoming elections this May for the Assembly. We'll be looking at what power sharing is and whether its days are actually numbered. This week, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, addressed the world in a TV conference. He accused the West of trying to split Russian society and provoke civil confrontation. He also said that he wants to disarm and denazify Ukraine. What tosh. We'll be breaking down the speech and President Putin's delivery. And in Scrap Reform Keep, we'll be deciding what needs to happen when it comes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts as usual, though much more important than mine, on power sharing in Northern Ireland. Do you think it still actually works? You can tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can watch us online too on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page. Thank you very much. Now, the scenes of women and children crossing the Ukrainian border to seek a new life as a refugee, as their male loved ones kiss them goodbye to head back into their country to defend it from Russian tyranny, have been ones that have moved many of us. The right of Ukraine to self-determination, to join whatever club it wants, and to face westwards, is one most of us reckon is worth defending. That's why our nation was the first to train up Ukrainian troops 
and to send equipment, something we ought to be immensely proud of. It's reminded me, though, that there's one constituent part of our United Kingdom that finds itself stripped of its right to self-determination, of its right to be British, of its right to unfettered trade with Great Britain, by far its biggest trading partner, of its right to have the same rules and regulations as the rest of the United Kingdom, and its right to experience the benefits of Brexit that the rest of the country are going to enjoy. That's right, folks. I was reminded of Northern Ireland and the dreaded Northern Ireland Protocol. Can you imagine for a second, just try and visualise this, if Scotland voted for independence and an independent Scotland told England that we had to follow EU rules to avoid a border with Scotland, we'd rightly be furious. It's an emotion felt by many unionists in Northern Ireland today. There's a great sense of bitter betrayal by those in Westminster. It's as simple as this, folks, right? A constituent part of the United Kingdom cannot remain a client state of Brussels. It's patently absurd that goods passing from England, Wales or Scotland are subject to checks when crossing to Northern Ireland. And guess what? It's all been policed by the European Court of Justice based in Luxembourg. The, the devolved administration in Northern Ireland has actually collapsed over unionist demands to scrap the protocol and government sources are reportedly starting to grow anxious about striking a deal with the EU over the protocol before the May 5th elections take place in Northern Ireland. Now, folks, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has been somewhat busy, I think it's fair to say. She's been dealing with the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But the government simply cannot forget about Northern Ireland. I think the time has passed since the government ought to have triggered Article 16. That's the process to actually bring an end to Northern Ireland's suffering under this Brussels protocol. To give you an idea of the havoc that this protocol has actually caused, the Belfast Telegraph's Sam McBride reports that a month ago, a British a Northern Irish lorry carrying New Zealand and Australian lamb was stopped at the Irish sea border in Belfast Harbour and the frozen food that was supposed to be used by a Northern Ireland manufacturer from this shipment and made into ready meals in NI instead sat there for five whopping days before heading back to Britain, obviously meaning Northern Ireland missed out. There's all of a sudden a hardening at the border that no official on either side wants to own up to, whether that be Northern Ireland in Westminster, Whitehall or indeed in Brussels. But this obviously disadvantages Northern Ireland when producers and exporters reckon that they simply cannot do business with their Northern Ireland because of these ever-evolving rules and an ever-hardening border down the Irish Sea. What consent does this have from unionism in Northern Ireland? This is going to mean a hit to Northern Ireland jobs, to Northern Ireland's economy, and to Northern Ireland's consumers. And what makes it all the more extraordinary is that the British government seemed to be absolutely none the wiser that this was ha actually taking place. Ministers in Northern Ireland also none the wiser. It could be the case that actually civil servants, extraordinarily, have been taken instruction from Brussels when it comes to enforcement of ever-changing rules around the governance of this dreaded protocol. Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol is that safeguarding mechanism that can be used if the protocol leads to, and this is a quote from the actual text, serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist or to the diversion of trade. I think it's hard to argue that now isn't the time to utilise that article and to unshackle Northern Ireland from the regulatory quagmire that it actually finds itself in. In. But folks, we'll be hearing from a diverse set of views in Northern Ireland on this issue of power sharing and the protocol. As ever, please do let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. It's now 2.11 and we're going to kickstart the show with a debate about whether or not power sharing is dead. 
It's what sets Northern Ireland's government apart from the UK's other devolved administrations. It means that in any government, there must be representatives from both the nationalist community and unionists. This way, it's hoped that both communities have a say in making the system and their democracy work. I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Jamie Bryson, who is a unionist activist and author of Brexit Betrayed, writings from the referendum to the Betrayal Act. And David Taylor, he's an Ulster Unionist councillor for Newry and, and also from the Social Democratic and Labour Party councillor, Adam Gannon joins me on the show. Right, David, can I start with you, please? Do you reckon there's hope still for power sharing in Northern Ireland? Well, sorry, uh, listen, there's understandably genuine concerns within the unionist community regarding the, uh, regarding the protocol. And that obviously has put significant pressure on power sharing in Northern Ireland, given the decision by the, the DEP to remove their, the First Minister from position. But ultimately, I do believe in terms of the greater long term interest of unionism, that a stable, sustainable, devolved government in Northern Ireland is the best way of actually securing the long term future of the union. So. Uh, whilst I have genuine concerns and strong concerns about the protocol and the impact that that's having with, within Northern Ireland and within the unionist community, uh, I ultimately believe that power sharing and the removal of power sharing is not the way of addressing the concerns that exist in, in respect of that. Uh, we believe you know, that in terms of the decision by the DEP, it's clear that it actually hasn't made any difference in terms of the government's approach to actually dealing with the protocol. It's clear that there's a, a need for intense negotiations between themselves between the UK government and the EU and the EU need to you know, stand, stand up to their responsibilities they have been reckless in regards to uh, the, the position of Northern Ireland and their intransigence in terms of dealing with the issue of the protocol but ultimately we believe in a period of intense negotiations and serious negotiations is a way of dealing with this rather than actually putting the, the long-term future of power sharing at risk. Yeah, Jamie, then, go, turning to you for a second, I'm actually confused by the position set out by some unionists because ultimately, if, if we actually say power sharing, let's pull it away, don't we just hand a massive amount of power to Boris Johnson, who betrayed Northern Ireland? Well, good afternoon, Darren. Um, well, the issue here is that uh, in 1998, when the unionist community signed up to the Belfast Agreement, it was the Ulster Unionist Party was a... Uh, uh, David Taylor's party was the lead party uh, in pro agreement unionism, mm. and and the so, the sole basis of that, in the words of of David Trimble at the time, was that the the principle of consent would ensure that there was no change to the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, uh, save for the consent of the majority of people uh, living there, uh, and he defined that as uh, the act of union. And under that quote, he said, "The act of union uh, is the union." Well, this week, the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland made clear, uh, and this is their words, the act of union has been subjugated uh, by the protocol. Uh, Northern Ireland is more in the EU than the UK. That's a direct quote from Lord Justice McCluskey. And that the, the, the apparent principle of consent, which the Ulster Unionist Party told us was a safeguard, is more like a chocolate fire guard because it doesn't, in fact, uh, prevent uh, such constitutional change as the subjugation of the acts of union. Now, if that is the sole basis and was the sole basis uh, which allowed unionism to support the institutions, how on earth does any self-respecting unionist continue in those institutions when it has been shown very clearly uh, that, that it was a deceptive snare and unionism was fundamentally deceived. And just uh, finally on the point that you made in your introduction, uh, at the end of January, the democratically elected unionist minister, uh, Mr. Edwin Putz, instructed officials uh, to halt checks at the Irish sea border. Officials defied the minister. They refused to uh, carry out that, that instruction. But yet, we, we now find out today via Sam McBride's reporting uh, that when the European Union instructed officials to increase checks, uh, they did so without any ministerial authority. And it seems we have some type of uh, constitutional coup uh, in Northern Ireland being waged uh, by civil servants. And that is an, an extraordinary uh, situation. Yeah, Adam, why should unionist communities have any faith in this process, given the fact that we are hearing reports of officials going with what the line of Brussels is? Firstly, we have consider how we got here. And the first thing is that the in Northern Ireland overwhelmingly 
And the people here are in favor of the protocol. Businesses are in favor of the um, And the people I talk to every day uh, across uh, my constituency and from and safe Rome, the protocol isn't new. What people are talking about is the cost of living crisis that we're in, hospital waits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on that point, as far as power sharing is concerned, Jamie, how would you go about ensuring instead that nationalist and unionist voices were, were given a, a voice in, in government in Northern Ireland? Well, there has to be a, a, a system of government which is inclusive for everybody. And the Belfast Agreement was, was purportedly based on a balance between unionist and nationalist communities. Uh, and that balance was uh, North South would be protected and East West. What the protocol has done is it has demolished uh, East West. It has subjugated uh, the union, subjugated the acts of union. That is what the Court of Appeal uh, has said. And the Belfast Agreement was also based upon the notion that key decisions were to be made with cross-community consent. But when it came to the protocol, and when it comes to the vote on the protocol, cross-community consent has been disapplied, has simply been taken out of the Belfast Agreement in order to neutralise unionists. So the Belfast Agreement has offered and does offer nothing to the, nothing to the unionist community. So if in order to have a stable uh, power-sharing government in Northern Ireland, there has to be a system of government which is fair to both sides and respects both sides of the community. And the Belfast Agreement does not do that. And I go back and I would like to hear what David Taylor has to say on that. The Ulster Unionists sold the Belfast Agreement on the principle of consent. The principle of consent has been shown to be a fundamental deceit. What do the UP have to say about that? Well, yeah, David, you can answer that question. You can come back to that. But equally, I'd like to know, do you actually think that the unionist, uh, I guess, dismissal of the protocol outright and actually a loss of faith in the shared institutions outright, do you actually, is this because unionism has had its day in Northern Ireland? Are unionists now becoming quite desperate because we're starting to see that Sinn Féin could hold a majority in Northern Ireland? No, ultimately, I, I think, Darren, that the clear majority of people in Northern Ireland wish to remain part of the United Kingdom. But there is no doubt, and, and in fact, my party was the first party out of all the unionist parties involved to recognise the dangers associated with the protocol. Protocol, we've been stating from as far back as October 9, 2019 about the dangers that this would place in terms of the constitutional integrity of Northern Ireland's position with the United Kingdom. So, you know, we were well aware of the dangers associated with this, and we warned the government not to sign up to a deal that was going to say, place severe damage on Northern Ireland's economic damage. position and the constitutional integrity of our position within the UK. So we are well aware of the dangers that were associated with the protocol. And we're also in a situation here where we're trying to find solutions to that uh, and serious solutions that will in, 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 in end up you know, securing the long-term future of uh, devolved institutions in Northern Ireland. Because as I've already said, ultimately, I believe that secures the long-term place of Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom. If we have a settled and sustainable devolved government, I believe that will increase support for the union in the long term, irrespective of what people's background may be. So there's a, there's a significant piece to work of work to do here. There's no doubt that the UK has caused severe damage in terms of their approach to this. They signed up to a deal that they should have been clear was going to cause damage to Northern Ireland's position within the UK. But there was almost an urgency on Boris Johnson's part to do a deal. And in doing that, he missed out on various issues that have caused the damage that we're now dealing with today. But ultimately, the EU needs to stand up their responsibilities too in this because they have been entrenched throughout this process and haven't faced up to the genuine unionist concerns that there are regarding the protocol. And it's not just about unionism. This damage is everybody in society in Northern well, Ireland. Yeah, that we was going to be my question to, you know, to Adam uh, there. Irrespective of what background they come from being affected struggling. by this protocol. Absolutely. Businesses are struggling, Adam. I know you're saying that you're not hearing it much on the doorstep from people out and about. But do you think that's going to change once it starts to be clear that businesses are just saying, let's not deal with Northern Ireland. It's too complicated. There's massive opportunity provided by the protocol to have uh, one foot in, in the EU market is very important and a massive opportunity for businesses here. That's what uh, people are saying. And we have to consider what Jamie mentioned there about consent. Brexit wasn't done with the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. There was no cross-community consent there. Uh, what did get cross-community consent uh, was the good agreement, which enshrines power sharing, uh, which is what we're, we're here to discuss discuss here today and when you think about it th this whole DUP pointless it's it's a selfish political stunt uh, walking out of the executive simply because they weren't performing well in the polls it's a political move there's no substance to it and 
what we need is we need constructive people who want to work together to resolve the issues. Now, the protocol is by no means perfect. We wanted, and my own party, the SDLP, wanted the closest possible relationship to the EU for not just Northern Ireland, but the entirety of the UK, uh, because that is what the best deal was uh, for us. You can't, uh, and as has been proven by the numerous problems since Brexit occurred, the, having the closest possible relationship is the way forward and the protocol protects people. I'm currently about 10, 15 miles from uh, the border here in South Tyrone, uh, between North and South. And what's the alternative to the protocol? Uh, I know GME would be very keen to have a hard border uh, along the island of Ireland, which would just be totally unsustainable. It would destroy communities uh, right across uh, many counties and across yeah. the whole border area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, We're day, day have life, to end that border it. Every, minute, every day. Absolutely. In, in one word then, from each of you, do you think PowerShare and In and I has had its day, Jamie? Day, Jamie. Uh, uh, Belfast Agreement, PowerShare has had its day. No self-respecting unionists continue with such a fundamental deceit. David? It's very hard to answer that question in one word. I think it's under significant <laughs> pressure, Darren. Uh, but I, as I've already said, I think in terms of uh, Northern Ireland's position, in terms of pro future prosperity and our position with the United Kingdom being sustained, I think it's vitally important that the evolution is protected in the long term. Adam? Power sharing, it has to continue. It's the only way this place will work. It has to be done to, to benefit everyone here. And uh, of course, if parties decide to throw the toys out of the pram and not uh, nominate for positions, um, I think you'll find the public will not uh, like that. And it'll be clear in this election, people will vote in their in their droves for parties who want to work together and want to see uh, this place work and that support the protocol. Well, we will see. Thank you very well, much. Well, we will see. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. That was Jamie Bryson, a unionist activist and author of Brexit, Betrayed, and Councillor David Taylor and Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you very much to all three of them. Plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be looking at the TV conference which was held by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, this week, where he called for the denazification of Ukraine. I'll be joined by a guest who can break down what was said and how he said it. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry and clear, though turning chilly and remaining windy in the west. Let's take a look at the details. After a sunny but windy day in the southwest this evening, winds will ease, but it will turn a little cloudier across the south, clearer in the north, but feeling cooler. In the southeast, it will be a breezy end to the day, but cloudless skies will continue, still feeling cooler in the breeze along the coast. Moving over to South Wales, where we can expect this evening to be dry and fine, but breezy still and chilly off sunset. Now moving north to the Midlands, tonight will be dry with clear skies, though over the hills and in the east, a fresh breeze will continue to bring a colder feel. Moving on to northeast England now, uh, breezy on the hills this evening, but clear and dry for all. There could be the odd spot of fog in the valleys, and it will continue to feel cold. Across southern Scotland, it will also be a clear and dry night with the odd misty patch. However, over hills it will turn increasingly windy this evening. Finally, to Northern Ireland, a windy but clear evening. So if you are planning on enjoying the last of the sunshine here, you'll likely need a layer or two. For many, it will remain clear overnight with a touch of frost by the morning, but cloud will increase in some western areas. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me and Naya Falaran Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here from big ideas to questions shaping the public conversation. We tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here, GB News.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, this week, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, spoke at a televised video conference. He accused the West of trying to split Russian and society and provoke civil confrontation. He also said that he wants to disarm and denazify Ukraine. It wasn't just what he said that caught my attention, folks, but actually the tone in which he said it. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Lawrence Bernstein, the director at Great Speech Writing, to analyse this speech. Lawrence, first of all, at a time of war, how do you actually deliver an effective speech to your nation? Do you think this was one that would have united Mother Russia behind President Putin? Good afternoon. I think, look, it's a very, very good question. And I think it's very easy to to, to come up with sort of the one-stop shop answer to how you speak in any event. Clearly, Putin on one end, uh, taking part in the same war as Zelensky on the other, have completely different approaches, completely different styles. I guess it's very easy for us in the West to look on this as absolute absurdity and nonsense. Um, but there must be clearly some tactical thinking behind the way he's behaving generally, not least when he's speaking in public. A lot of people have criticised President Putin's actions here and said, well, they're so completely, you know, out of the question, extraordinary and all the rest of it, that he must be losing his mind. Does this speech, does the presentation of this speech, does this oratory give you the impression of a man who's losing his marbles? Look, with Putin, I think what we've probably got to do is compare Putin now to Putin a few weeks ago when he seemed much more composed and in control. There certainly are signs. He's, he's, he appears more intolerant than he's ever been. He appears more angry than he's ever been. He is stating fact in a way that people do often when they're under pressure. If you look at his face, and again, I've, this, this isn't, I'm sure this isn't news to, to anybody who's watched him, it's getting puffier, his eyes are mm. getting narrower, um, his stare is getting more and more that of a maniac. So there are a number of signs. But again, I think we've just got to be slightly careful in that you and I, I don't think, are Putin's target audience. No. Um, and we may not be seeing things quite through the same eyes as his own audience inside Russia. Now, Lawrence, for those listening on radio who can't actually see the subtitles, uh, here's Putin actually talking about Russian people being able to distinguish the difference between patriots from traitors and scum. Любой народ, а тем более российский народ, всегда сможет отличить истинных патриотов 
от подонков и предателей и просто выплюнет их, как случайно залетевшую в рот мушку, выплюнет на панель. What do you make of this, of the tone used here? Because it strikes me as being cool as a cucumber whilst asserting these claims. Does that make a difference in, in this sort of, you know, being more aggressive and being more calm? How does this actually, do you think, come across? Look, the, the, the guy is a master of his own truth. I mean, if, 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 if listening to the, the entire speech, he also starts to talk about the Nazism of Ukraine. Um, he's talking about um, traitors from within, a fifth column of national traitors. I mean, the, the guy is paranoid. Mm. Um, and he is using the language, which obviously is very redolent of Hitler in the in the 1930s, at the same time accusing his neighbouring country of being a Nazi state. So, so clearly, I do worry that we're trying to create rational analysis around a guy who is increasingly irrational, which is what's particularly petrifying about him and his behaviour and the way he's speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when you compare the, the speech that he's actually made the last one that we just saw comments from there to the to the rally in Moscow, where you, it looks pretty impressive, right? It looks sort of yes. it's packed out, packed to the rafters. But there are reports that said that actually people were told, well, you can be off school if you come. You, you know, we'll bus you in. That sort of uh, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Just stand and wave a flag. Apparently, some people got checked, stamped that they'd been there, then left straight away. There's some analysis suggesting that actually, you know, the whole thing was just completely staged, so to speak. Do you actually think that the cheering crowds, the music, were we seeing a different side to Putin or was this just performance, theatre? It's, perform it's the performance of, a, of an autocrat. I mean, look, we, when it comes to this stuff, I think, you know, I'd, I'd love to think I had the answers to everything because I, I write and analyse speeches. Um, I, I think probably as relevant as anything is I was lucky enough to go to the World Cup in Russia three or four years ago and walked around the streets of Russia and met countless Russian people having drinks and coffees in, in, in places all, all around the, the west side of the country. And those are not people who would have been voluntarily going to that rally. I could tell you that much. Now, <laughs> when you read reports coming through Reuters, coming through the BBC, as you say, that, that state workers are being told they have to go there, school kids, college kids are being told they don't have to go to lectures to turn up. He surrounds himself with pop groups. I mean, again, it, it's authoritarian. It's In some ways, it's not unlike some of the feeds we see coming from North Korea, um, but in a state that in, it wasn't that long ago that we were behaving with Russia as a, as a neighbour. We may have treated slightly cautiously, but who we were trading with and behaving with as if they were a, a relatively straightforward neighbour. It's an extraordinary turn. It is an extraordinary time, and I think um, I think we're going to see more speeches than just that one, that's for sure. Lawrence Bernstein, <laughs> at the, the director at Great Speech Writing, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. Next, we'll be going back to basics. What happens if Russia isn't able or doesn't pay back its international debts? Now it's time for a check on the headlines with Simon Pusey. Hello, it's 2.35. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB newsroom. The war in Ukraine has dominated the Conservative Party's spring conference, with the Prime Minister saying Russia's president launched the invasion because he fears a free and democratic nation as his neighbour. Boris Johnson told the Tory faithful a victorious Vladimir Putin will not stop in Ukraine. It will be the green light for autocrats everywhere in the Middle East, in the Far East. This is a turning point for the world, and it's a moment of choice. It's a choice between freedom and oppression. In Ukraine, the prosecutor's office says 112 children have been killed since the start of the invasion. President Vladimir Zelensky is calling for face-to-face -face talks with his Russian counterpart, telling Vladimir Putin it's time for comprehensive and meaningful negotiations. 
In other news, Syria's president has made his first trip to an Arab state since the war began in his country 11 years ago. Travelling to the United Arab Emirates, President Bashar al-Assad met Abu Dhabi's Crown Prince Sheikh Zayed al Nayan in a sign of strengthening ties between the two nations. The U.S. has reacted, saying it's disappointed and troubled by the apparent attempt to legitimise the Syrian leader. The government is being urged to publish the legal advice it received on whether P&O ferries broke the law when it sacked its staff. Labour is asking if there are legal moves ministers could take to reverse the decision. 800 employees were fired without consultation via a pre-recorded message on Thursday. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll be back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes after this short break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. It's time now to pop into my virtual classroom. Russia has claimed it's made a, a key interest payment to international investors and avoided a debt default, but investors have not yet reportedly been paid. If the payments aren't made by the April the 30th, then Russia would be in default. But what does all this mean? A lot of people are actually saying, hang on a minute, uh, we're going to seriously harm Western economies by doing this. To explain all of this, I'm joined by Julian Jessup, who's an independent economist. Now, this week, Julian, you wrote an article in The Spectator called What Happens If Russia Defaults? First of all, what does that debt default phrase actually mean? Well, first of all, this is a really unusual position because Russia can't actually afford to, to pay its debts. It's still got an enormous amount of foreign currency reserves. Um, and a lot of its debt is actually denominated in its own currency. And in principle, it can always print more rubles if it wants to. So this is sort of a fairly artificial situation. Um, what's happening, though, is that Russia can't actually make international payments because of Western sanctions. So, so the problem is sort of a result of the sanctions rather than anything you know, failings within the Russian financial system itself. Um, the reassuring news is that Russia is actually not an important player in the global financial system. The, um, the amount of debt it has is, is relatively small. Um, and also, most of this has been priced in. I mean, people have been writing down their, their Russian assets for a while. Most people expected something bad to happen. Um, so there won't be huge financial losses for Western institutions as a result of this. Mm. But I wouldn't dismiss it entirely. We've sort of been here before, you know, small ripples in one small part of the global pond can cause a tsunami of losses somewhere else, as we saw in 
the global financial crisis, and indeed in 1998 when Russia last defaulted. So um, I think it's a small risk, but definitely one worth watching. As an economist who's obviously seen things over time, we've seen the some nations come and go from perhaps the international trading system as they uh, do things that we don't approve of here in the West. Do you actually worry, if, we, if you put your historian hat on, Julian, about the, the, what will, the repercussions, essentially, of saying to Russia, we want now to do with you as far as you know, global international trade is concerned. Do you think actually Russia, mm. everyday Russians, are going to be driven even more into the arms of President mm. Putin and not into the arms of the West? Well, I think that is a risk. I think sanctions need to be selective. You have to do sort of like a cost-benefit analysis of everything that you do. I mean, because clearly there are benefits in terms of putting pressure on the on the Russian regime, but also you might be hurting Russian people. There, there are some things that we could do, like a complete ban on exports of Russian energy, that would actually cause an enormous amount of damage to to vulnerable households in the UK as well. So, I, I think you need to look at these things on a case by case basis. Um, I certainly think cause sort of blanket bans on on, on Russian trade are not helpful. I think you need to be far more careful than that. Um, I also think actually military assistance is probably the, the key now rather than just economic and, and, and financial uh, support. So military assistance, obviously, in this case for, for Ukraine to help them to, to win the war. Um, in, the, in the bigger scheme of things, I say that Russia's not actually that big an economy. Uh, it's clearly critical to energy markets, but overall, it's only about 3% of, of, of global GDP. It's not a it's not a big country. Um, but as we've seen in previous crises, you, you can get sort of unintended or unexpected shocks. Um, one we started to see recently is that Russia has started effectively um, confiscating jets that are owned and leased by Western companies that happen to be you know, parked in Russia at the moment. And that's potentially £10 billion worth of, of losses that airline leasing companies are going to have to cover in one way or another. So they're these sort of unanticipated things that people might not be aware of. We, we know who owns the debt, but not necessarily sort of second round hidden shocks elsewhere in the economy and the financial system. You sort of touched on it there ever so slightly, Julian, but what impact do you think this is going to actually, these sanctions are going to have on us here in the UK? Because, you know, we're all applauding right now and saying, mm. goody, goody, I think it's right and proportionate for Russia to face these sanctions. But how much are we going to suffer and how much do you think the Chancellor will be thinking about this ahead of the spring statement? Mm. Mm. Well, th this gets really tricky because in, in terms of the direct impact of, of Western sanctions on Russia, the impact should be quite small. I mean, we, you know, the key players are continuing to buy large amounts of Russian oil and gas. And so there's, there's little direct effect on prices. But uh, markets obviously speculate. And that's why we've seen these big increases in wholesale prices of, of energy. And those will never be passed on to, uh, to consumers and businesses in, in one way or another. So you've got the, that effect. Um, you've also got the knock on effect on, on other markets. So lots of other things, not just energy, we should be talking about. It's things like food and uh, you know, industrial metals and so on. And that will feed into inflation pressures too. So um, I think there are lots of ways in which this could you know, reverberate around the British economy and low income households in particular. Um, in terms of what the, the Chancellor should do about it, well, I, I think he should definitely do a bit more in the coming week. He does have the, the spring statement, as you know, on, on Wednesday. He's desperately to avoid us, uh, for us to avoid calling it a mini budget, but that's got the potential to do so. Uh, and I think there is more that he could do to ease the burden on, on low income households in particular. Um, I mean, ideally, I'd like to see him cancel the, the planned tax increases. Um, he probably won't do that. He's invested too much political capital in that to, to back down now. But it could offset their impact by you know, raising the thresholds at which people start paying tax. Um, I think he should probably top up the, the benefits that low-income households receive uh, and probably lower fuel duty as well. So there are a number of different levers he can pull. Um, the public finances are actually in a better state than he anticipated. So there's some wriggle room for him to, to help out here as well. Yeah, I mean, there won't feel like wriggle room is there for a lot of households up and down the country, will there, Julian, at the moment? It, things mm. are probably as worse as they've been in my entire life. Yes, and the, 
It will disproportionately hit low-income households. I mean, they'll, they'll see the, the biggest increase in their bills relative to their income or their expenditure because, of course, they, they spend more of their income on things like energy and food, which is where the price increases are likely to be the, the biggest. Um, on top of that, of course, poorer people are far less likely to have savings uh, that they might have accumulated during the pandemic to, to tide them over uh, a temporary squeeze on income. So, you know, there, there's no wriggle room at all, as you say, for, for them. Um, to be fair, the government has already done a fair bit there in terms of topping up benefits and the, the national living wage. And um, there are some support measures in place, but they were really designed before the latest surge in energy prices, before the Ukraine crisis. And I think the government now needs to recognise it needs to do more than that. Yeah, absolutely. Julian Jessup, independent economist, thank you very much for your time today. Just time now for a quick hit on Grimewatch. Throughout the week on social media, I post my views on some of the big news stories of the week, and you're always very kind to give your opinions, which are much more valuable than my own. On Thursday, I was watching my beloved Newcastle play Everton, and then an environmentalist tied his neck to the goalpost calling for Britain to stop oil. On Facebook, I posted, I wonder if these people have any idea just how difficult life is going to be for British business consumers and much else without oil and gas. And to add insult to injury, Newcastle lost the damn game. But hey, oh, the less said about that, the better. But plenty of you got in touch to have your say about the protester. Danny commented, most of these guys just see engine oil, petrol and diesel. They've got no idea how much else is made from crude oil and how utterly screwed would be if we'd stopped it. Yes, I don't think the bloke realised, did he, that the, the tie he had around his neck is made from crude oil, but moving swiftly on. Whereas in response to the stop oil protester, Al said, the oil that made the plastic for the... Oh, he's saying exactly what I said. The oil that made the plastic for the glasses he's wearing, the oil in the shoes that he's wearing, the oil that was used by the ships that transported his jeans from the other side of the world. I could go on and on. Well said. Les tweeted me saying, imagine how hard it'll be to simply live in Northern Europe without heating until there is readily available alternative or we just chop down every tree we can find. It's just dreamland. I couldn't agree with you more. Lee said, hold on, Darren. Maybe the fact we're so dependent on oil is the issue. On the issue of oil, Cliff added, the only reliable solutions for the future of this country's energy supply are renewable sources and modular nuclear. Yeah, problem with nuclear is that it's going to take a while to come online, folks, and we cannot get by on a wing and a prayer. And finally, Cindy said, I think the protester was great. It must have taken some courage to do a solo demonstration like that. Oh, please, Cindy, I think he was loving the attention. He believes in a cause and is fighting for a better world using coal, oil and gas. And we'll all need to stop if we are to avoid the worst effects of climate change. You tell that to the world's poorest, right, who will face their children dying or being in dire poverty for the rest of their lives without access to these fossil fuels. I think that's a fantasy. Anyway, next up, folks, on Campus Clash, do we need more censorship to cancel so-called disinformation? Some say that the new online safety bill is curtailing our free speech online. How do we get the right balance here? To discuss, I'm joined by Adam Wildsmith. What a cracking name. He's a journalism, media and culture student at Newcastle University. And Anna McGovern, she's an English student at Queen Mary University of London. Can I start with you, please, Anna? Anna, do you think we need more cancellation, essentially, to cancel disinformation, silence more voices and stop the proponents of this dis disinformation online? Thank you. Um, absolutely not. I think this is a very dangerous path to go down. I think when you start introducing things such as censorship within universities, which are meant to be an institution to promote free speech, they're meant to encourage students to think critically for themselves. I think this could really be dangerous for students who are coming to university for the first time and they're learning new things, they're taking on new modules they haven't done before. And when you're introducing things like this, I think this is a very dangerous path. So, no, I'm absolutely against this. Adam, then, what, what's your view on that? Well, I, su I support it in part. I think the, the bill's important because, it, it, it of course, you know, there's fines for, for, for tech giants that refuse to, to combat disinformation online. I agree with Anna in a sense that I think um, 
it's perhaps the, the bill's a bit ambiguous when it, it, it talks about legal but harmful speech. I mean, what is that and who defines yeah. it? So I think we agree in that respect of that that goes a bit far. Um, but I think when you look at some of the other parts of, of the bill, such as safeguards for children, then safeguards for consumers against scam ads, perhaps, I think it is important in that respect. If we take the pandemic as a sort of um, a, a, sub, a test subject, as a case, a subject case, case study, and we say, right, well, at the start of the pandemic, Fauci in America and the chief medical scientists in our country would have said, well, hang on, you don't need to wear masks. Mask wearing, you know, let's not make it mandatory. They don't make much of a difference. That, of course, that advice changed throughout the course of the pandemic. And we were all told you must wear masks and it was compulsory. That would have been, had I said at the start of the pandemic, we should be wearing masks, that would have been quote unquote disinformation. To what extent, Adam, do you worry that actually what's disinformation to somebody is free speech to somebody else? I think there's a fine line between disinformation and misinformation. So I think if you take the pandemic, for example, saying that people shouldn't wear masks at the beginning, I think that might have been an example of misinformation where perhaps the scientists were wrong. But I think to say that they knowingly lied and knowingly told the public not to wear them when they think they should have done, I don't think that's entirely accurate. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all, though. But I'm saying even if you look back, there are public health studies throughout. Look, go back to the 1990s when the uh, public science, public health officials would have said that homosexuality was a mental illness, for example. They obviously don't say that now. Were I to have argued in 1990 and the internet was around that I disagree vehemently with that and that homosexuality isn't a mental disorder, I would have been told that I'm guilty of disinformation. That's my concern. I think that's where me and Anna agree. I think the bill goes too far in terms of harmful content or harmful language. Um, I think that should be sort of left to individuals to decide. But in terms of something where, you know, something is clearly wrong, clearly untrue, I think there is an onus on social media uh, sites to, to remove that or to at least flag it uh, so consumers can, can see that that's wrong. Yeah, well, Anna, is that what you'd like to see then? You'd just like to see more of these, do you remember the Trumpian disinformation claims, one which Twitter would use quite often? It's amazing, actually, to me that they don't do it as with the Russian officials, but that's a whole other show. Do you, is that what you'd like to see to sort of combat this and, and a, a halfway house solution to, to actually combat and so-called disinformation? Well, I think when you put the power in Oh, Anna's signal is going off there. Adam, I'll just let you come back in on that, on that point. Do you just, is that what you'd like to see, more disclaimers? Is that the way to actually do this? I, yeah, I think that's important. I think disclaimers on, uh, you know, articles or, or posted are, are untrue. It's probably better than to remove them altogether. It gives the, the public an opportunity to see what politicians or celebrities might have said um, without removing it altogether. But I think flagging it as, as wrong, untrue or disinformation is probably the right way to go. But yeah, ultimately, though, who do, when, we're dis, when we're saying to regulators, when we're saying to big tech, when we're saying to Nick Clegg that actually you are the ultimate arbiter of, of so quote unquote disinformation and all the rest of it, do you not think we're giving them a little bit too much power? We talk a lot about increased power for big tech giants. This bill is the ultimate for... Anna, you're back with me. Put that question to you. Do you worry that actually we're get, putting too much power into the hands of the likes of Nick Clegg and big tech companies? Absolutely. And the fact that they are the deciding, um, they're the ones that are deciding what is and what isn't disinformation, I think that is very dangerous because we, you can have social media actually shut things down that actually turn out to be true. Um, and they, the power goes into their hands. Um, you know, things that come out from the media that, you know, when we're, you know, highlighting politicians, for example, things that they have done, the media have the power to shut that down and then the general public will not necessarily know what goes on behind the scenes. So I think generally this is a very dangerous path. Yeah, Anna McGovern and Adam Wildsmith, thank you very much for giving your thoughts today. Two very eloquent students there from both sides of the debate on the online safety bill. You have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. It's flown over. Thank you very much for your company. The show's on every Saturday and Sunday at 2pm.
But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry and clear, though turning chilly and remaining windy in the west. Let's take a look at the details. After a sunny but windy day in the southwest this evening, winds will ease, but it will turn a little cloudier across the south, clearer in the north, but feeling cooler. In the southeast, it will be a breezy end to the day, but cloudless skies will continue, still feeling cooler in the breeze along the coast. Moving over to South Wales, where we can expect this evening to be dry and fine, but breezy still and chilly off sunset. Now moving north to the Midlands, tonight will be dry with clear skies, though over the hills and in the east a fresh breeze will continue to bring a colder feel. Moving on to northeast England now, uh, breezy on the hills this evening, but clear and dry for all. There could be the odd spot of fog in the valleys and it will continue to feel cold. Across southern Scotland, it will also be a clear and dry night with the odd misty patch. However, over hills it will turn increasingly windy this evening. Finally, to Northern Ireland, a windy but clear evening. So if you are planning on enjoying the last of the sunshine here, you'll likely need a layer or two. For many, it will remain clear overnight with a touch of frost by the morning, but cloud will increase in some western areas. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you oh. look it up. I hug everyone on oh. it. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank